استغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله I had a good rest. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> it's good to sometimes have a break. Um, you don't realize how tired you are. But the istiqamah is something that is praiseworthy in the deen. And the uh, shaitan comes to you when you are having a break. So they have, have some more time off and then what happens is you never start again. So it's good to see your faces. And uh, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the istiqama and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to continue with this majalis and to continue with the desire to learn about the deen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit you from this class. So the discussion today will be with regards to the voluntary prayers. Last time we discussed the sunnah prayers and we did the, uh, the witr prayer. So we discussed in detail when those sunnah mu'akkada and sunan prayer are. And so inshallah today we'll move on to the other voluntary prayers. First thing to say is when the person finishes the fard prayer, the sunnah in the Hanafi madhhab <coughs> is that he does not do his entire dhikr before he stands up to pray his sunnah prayers. The most he should do is astaghfirullah, 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 Allahumma inta salam, aminka salam, until the end of it. And then he stands up to pray the remaining sunnah prayers. This is opposed to the other three imams. The other three imams say the person should complete his dhikr and then do his sunnah prayers. So that is with regards to the timing. Then with regards to the place, it is the sunnah for the imam that he prays his sunnah and voluntary prayers where he has led the prayer. Except that he should move slightly to the left so that someone who has come late can realize that the imam is not praying the father prayer, but in fact he's praying his own sunnah prayer. So you will see that when I finish leading the prayer, I usually move to the left here and I pray my sunnah prayers over there. However, for the follower, for him it is permitted that he can either stay where he has done his fard prayer or he may choose to move to another portion of the masjid and pray there and it is preferred to move places. Why is it preferred to move places? The reason being that when you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah you attend to do the salam to whoever is on your right hand side and the malaika and the pious jinns. Right? And when you do assalamu alaikum to the left, it's to all of those who are on your left, the malaika and the pious jinn. So when you move position, then you are saying salam to more people. Secondly, that when you move positions, then that place will give witness on the day of judgment that you had prayed in that place. So the earth will give witness on the day of judgment that so and so walk to the masjid on me and so and so prayed on me. And so you will see that from the sunnah of the Eid prayer and the Jummah prayer, we will do those sessions separately. What are the sunnah there? Is that a person should come to the masjid in one way and return home in another way so that more places of the earth can bear witness that you walked on them to go to the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are you know, reports of Salihin who went to Masjid al-Haram and have written that in the time that were there, they prayed two rak'ah behind every single pillar in the masjid. How many of you have prayed two rak'ah be behind all of these pillars? Has anyone done that yet? No. So this is maybe a target for you to try and achieve, inshallah. That in this masjid, try and pray two rak'ah behind each of these pillars. May Allah give you the tawfiq to go to Masjid al-Haram and pray two rak'ah behind every pillar in the masjid. There are probably a, th a few thousand pillars there now. <laughs> Before, it wasn't that many. Certainly a lot bigger masjid now. The, uh, the voluntary prayers can be prayed at any time except for the non-permitted times. 
we'll come to the ikhtilaf of Imam Shafi'i with the Tahiyatul Masjid. With regards to the daytime voluntary prayers, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, it is preferred to be prayed in four rak'at. And the recitation is done in all four rak'at. As opposed to the fard prayer, where the recitation after the Qur'an is done in the first two rak'at and not the last two, the Fatiha is separate to the recitation. Okay? So the Fatiha is done in all the rak'at, and the recitation of the Qur'an after the Fatiha is done in the first two rak'at of the fard prayer. In the voluntary prayer, you do the recitation of the Qur'an following the Fatiha in all the rak'at of the prayer. In addition, there is something uh, that is unique to the four rak'ah voluntary prayer. So if someone is praying a four rak'ah sunnah or sunnah mu'akkada, he prays uh, in the following way. He does Allahu Akbar and then he does the istiftah and the ta'awwith, the basmala, the Qur'an the recitation. Right? And he does not repeat the istiftah and the ta'awwith. Right? Is that correct? Imam Shafi says the other three rak'at he starts with the basmala no he doesn't do iftiftah again right the other three rak'at he doesn't do the istiftah in the sunnah prayer and the further prayers right? the istiftah is done once in the beginning of the prayer and never repeated okay the ta'awud is done in the beginning and not repeated except that Imam Shafi says it is sunnah to repeat it in every rak'at with the fatiha the basmala is done before the Fatiha and before the Surah. Subhanak Allahumma wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayruh. Or, inni wajahtu wajhi lilladhi fatala samawati wa la'adha hanifa wa ma ana minal mushrikeen. Or some other thana or istiftah is the same thing. Same thing. So, you do the istiftah in the first rak'ah, the ta'awwith in the first rak'ah, the basmala in every rak'ah. Okay? In the voluntary prayers, Imam Abu Hanifa says that in the third rak'ah you do istiftah and ta'awwud as well. And it's perhaps something that people forget to do. This is not done in the sunnah mu'akkada, not done in the sunnah prayer, but it is done in the voluntary prayer where you are praying four rak'ah prayer. And the four rak'ah prayer is done in the daytime. And we'll come to further detail around that. Ihram. Yes. So, Allahu Akbar. Allah. Yes. Takbir al Ihram. Yes. Yes. But the other three. Yes. Without Ihram, yes. you continue because you have already in, in, in the prayer. Yes. So, Takbir al Ihram is done once in the prayer only, the prayer. which is the first takbira, and it is a rukun, a farad of the prayer. The takbira to get up from sujood to start the next rak'ah is takbiratul intiqal. It is a sunnah takbir. There's no istiftah after the sunnah takbir. Except that Imam Abu Hanifa said there's an istiftah in the third rak'ah of a voluntary prayer. Okay? When the Imam says uh, uh, every something has to, has to be done, if I don't do it, is there how is the validity of, of that for example for for uh, sunnah? Yes. I I uh, the hiram. Yes. Then I didn't make the iftitah. Uh -huh. This and this and this. Yes. What would happen with that? There's no istiftah for any madhab except the first rak'ah. Okay? Yeah. Get that plain and simple in your brain first. You got that? Yeah, no. Imam Shafi says that ta'awudh is a sunnah. And if you left the sunnah, what happens? Nothing. The validity of the prayer is there. What will impact the validity of the prayer? Is if you dropped a condition or if you dropped a faridah. Those are the only two things. If you drop them, they will invalidate the prayer. For example, you became a murtad after you finished praying. The prayer becomes everything before it became invalidated. <coughs> All right, you lost wudu in the fourth rak'ah as you were doing tashahud. The prayer is invalidated. You got it. 
leaving of the sunnah reduces the amount of reward you can get in the prayer, but it does not invalidate the prayer. And we mentioned before, subhanAllah, whose children is this? Kids, don't, don't play in the masjid, please. Okay. It is not recommended to do more than four rak'ah with one taslima. Okay? So in a daytime, voluntary prayer. So for example, someone is praying the duha prayer. The timing of the duha prayer is that it should be done after the sun has fully risen. Okay? Then you may pray the duha prayer and it needs to be done before the zawal. The zawal is when the sun is right at the meridian. So full sunrise until the meridian, you can pray the duha prayer and you can pray it as a four rak'ah. The other three imams say that daytime voluntary prayers were prayed as two rak'ah. Okay? A person can pray the duha prayer as four rak'ah. He can have another four rak'ah, but no more than 16 rak'ah in the duha prayer. Okay? Beyond 16, it will not be classed as duha. He will just be doing additional voluntary prayers. So he will not get the additional reward of the duha prayer. So duha prayer has additional re be reward beyond just a daytime voluntary prayer. So for example, someone prayed four voluntary prayers after the dhuhr for the prayer, he gets a regular reward. But if he prays those same four voluntary prayers at the time of duha, he gets an additional reward because he's praying it, a prayer that's in a, its uh, a preferred timing. So four rakah is only Correct. In the. For example, 16. Yes. Yes. Or four rakahs by 2 2 2 0. Oh. Yeah, so your Shafi, you will pray 2 2 2. 2 2. Yeah. Okay. The optimal for the Shafi's is from 2 to 8. Okay. Yeah. That's the optimal. In the night time, there is less ikhtilaf because there's more a hadith about the method of the prayer of the Prophet The optimal tahajjud prayer is to pray them two rak'ah by two rak'ah. Okay? You pray two rak'ah. You have to pray four. You pray, no. You, 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 the minimum you will pray is two. Okay? But if you're going to pray more than two, you don't pray four rak'ah with one taslima. You do two rak'ah, taslima. You wish to do another two, two rak'ah, another taslima, two rak'ah, another taslima. If you want to do more than two rak'ah with one taslima, then the optimal is to pray eight rak'at with one taslima. Okay? Instead of four, you do eight. So your option are to do eight, two or eight. Don't do four. Okay? So that's different to the daytime. The uh, Sahih Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that he used to pray the tahajjud in twos. But there are other narrations available that show that he prayed eight as well. All right? So the best way is to pray two by two. The position of the nighttime prayer from a legal perspective is that it is mustahab, it is recommended. Because the Prophet ﷺ prayed the tahajjud every single day in his life, without, you know, there are some uh, exceptions where that has happened, but he made up those prayers in the daytime. Because he did it so regularly, it is considered in practice to be a sunnah mu'akkadah. Okay? We're talking about tahajjud for the whole year. That it, it is in practice. Because of the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, it is a sunnah mu'akkadah. And whenever you study the Qur'an and the Hadith, the great sense that you will have is that tahajjud really is a mark of your Iman. If a person has proper Iman, he prays tahajjud. If the prop person wants to develop righteousness, wants to be from the Salihin, he prays tahajjud. And you know, tahajjud is uh, something that a alim and a student of knowledge should not do without. You should be doing it regularly. Even if it is just two rak'ah. Okay? And the timing of tahajjud is from Isha to Fajr. 
So let's say we are praying late now and we can't even pray Sunnah and Witr in the masjid anymore. You have to go and pray it at home. Simple thing is when you go home, you add two rak'ah after your Sunnah and you make the niyyah of tahajjud. You don't have to go to sleep before you pray. You, have to take a nap before you, pray. you don't have to. The timing of Imam Buhani, for example, it is said that he prayed tahajjud every single night from Aisha to Fajr for 40 years. He did not... He never went to sleep before he started his tahajjud. Right? The Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ used to take a nap, then get up, and he used to pray tahajjud. But there's also reports of him praying all night without going to sleep, before or after. Okay? So tahajjud must be before wut? I'm coming to that. We did like witr last week, but I'll mention one or two points about it. Before I come to witr. The nighttime prayer is superior than the daytime voluntary prayer. Okay? So if you're going to choose between the duha and the tahajjud, what is superior? Tahajjud. The prolonged standing in the tahajjud is superior than more sujood. How will you do more sujood? You will do more raka'ah. Right? So for example, someone prays 40 raka'ah of tahajjud. It is valid to do. But it is superior to pray eight long rak'at than it is to pray 40 short rak'at. Is that clear? Which requires you to memorize the Qur'an, which is something I discussed two or three classes ago. So make this an aim in your life that you memorize the Qur'an for the purpose of praying tahajjud. Is that clear, Hamza? You got it? You're listening? Good. All right. The witr prayer can be prayed before or after the hajjud, but it is superior to pray the witr prayer after the tahajjud. So the Prophet ﷺ has been noted to pray two rak'ah after the witr prayer. And when we come to taraweeh, we will discuss that in detail as well. Okay, so we did the night time and the day time and the duha. The tahajjud all night has been reported from the Prophet ﷺ in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. The two nights of Eid. What do I mean by the two nights of Eid? It is the night prayer before the Eid. So the night that you have before the Eid prayer. So it is the first of Shawwal night and the 10th of Dhul Hijjah night. Tahajjud all night has been reported and is a uh, a night of great reward. The first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are also reported of praying all night for Tahajjud. There are some weak ahadith with regards to the 15th of Sha'ban, so a person may follow that uh, option as well. The voluntary prayer may be prayed seated. Now we discussed this when we mentioned the rukun of standing, that it is allowed to pray a voluntary prayer seated even if the person is able to stand. This is not the case for a wajib prayer and not a case for a fard prayer. A person must be standing for those uh, prayers. The Prophet ﷺ has been reported that when he was on a travel on a beast like a camel or something like that, that he prayed the voluntary prayer seated on uh, that. So if, for example, someone is uh, traveling, uh, not while you're driving, while someone else is driving, uh, once you are outside the city limits, uh, you can pray a voluntary prayer seated in a moving carriage like a plane, or a car. And as we have discussed before, even though the car is not directed towards the qibla in the voluntary prayer, it is permitted to be praying it in a moving vehicle that is not directed towards the qibla. Yes, you have a question? Did I answer the question? Okay. That's always a yeah, good idea to be patient until I finish. <laughs> so you said Rasulullah used to pray whole night in the, in the last It has day. been reported in those nights, yes. The whole night. Yes, the whole so, night. So how, so, so the people say he prayed, so for those people who say he prayed only eight rakah, yes. not more than eight rakah in Ramadan, etc. Sure. So is it still he prayed those eight rakah the whole night, or how did, how did he? 
Yeah, you know, uh, don't get into the debate over A to N20. If we, if we simplify it, the report is that Prophet ﷺ prayed all night. And then that means that those eight rak'at were very long, right? So we have, uh, for example, I believe it is Abdullah bin Abbas who reported that the Prophet ﷺ, when he spent one night with him, that he started reading Baqarah, and then he went to Ali Imran, and then when he went to Ruku'ah, his Ruku' was longer than his recitation. And when he stood up, the standing was longer than his Ruku'ah. And when he went to Sujood, his Sujood was longer. So every single component was longer than the one before it. So if you and I were to read Baqarah, if you read Baqarah in Hadr, Hadr is quick recitation. Usually when the Hafiz does his revision, they do quick recitation, right? It will take you, my estimate is an hour and 20, 25 minutes just to do Baqarah. Ali Imran, shorter than that. So let's say it took you two hours in Hadr to do Baqarah and Ali Imran. And the recitation of the Prophet ﷺ was not in Hadr. He did not used to recite quickly. He used to recite with every single Tajweed rule, you know, and, you know, uh, there are other reports about the Prophet ﷺ stopping and repeating an ayah over and over again and thinking about it. So it was not a two hour standing but let's say just assume if, if it was two hours standing and then he did rukur for two hours and then standing for two hours and then two sujood for this is longer than one night has in terms of its time so the other thing that we understand is from the tahajjud of the prophet ﷺ, is that his time was given baraka that you and i can't perceive right so his one night of prayer would be much longer than you and i's prayer Right. Can I uh, pray in pieces and rest a little bit? Yes. And then start? Yes, you certainly can. The Prophet ﷺ saw one of his wife, I, I believe it was, it was um, Zainab radiallahu anha, that, that she had put two, she had put a rope between two pillars in the masjid. And he asked, Who has done this? So he was told that it is Zainab radiallahu anha. So he said, No, remove this. That don't pray in the don't pray in a situation where your body is so tired that you can no longer stand. You have to rest against something. Although it is permissible, it is you know not something that is you know encouraged that someone prays to this degree. Once you are tired or you are so drowsy that you are falling asleep, the person is better off resting rather than continuing with the prayer because it's possible that when he gets so tired, he mixes up things. He sends the mu'minun to Jahannam and he sends the kuffar to Jannah, you know. So, uh, the person should not pray when he is that tired. The purpose of the nighttime prayer is taqarrab to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to feel that the person is away from the people and there between him and his Rabb. And from the, the ibadat, it is the most beautiful ibadat. There is no ibadat like the tahajjud prayer. And uh, last Ramadan, I was mentioning this to, to the people here. And one person came to me two, two mornings later. He said to me, I followed your advice and I prayed the tahajjud prayer for the first time in my life. And he said that it is a feeling like no other. I, I never had this feeling in my entire life that I had that day in the tahajjud prayer because no one is watching you. No one knows you are awake. So your niyyah, your ikhlas and niyyah is better in that time than any other prayer. So yes, two days ago I discussed with you giving the money in public and in secret. When you give it in public, people are encouraged to give money. And when you give money in secret, your heart gets the benefit. In the same way, our farther prayer is in public so that everyone saw that you prayed the father prayer no one will say you are a munafiq okay and in addition the houses that you walk past the businessmen that you walk past saw that you prayed the father prayer you're going to the father prayer they get encouraged to come to the father prayer and then the tahajjud prayer is there so that you pray it in secret for the benefit of the heart 
Okay, that was a little diversion from fiqh. Anyway, the, these things are important to mention because as you remember the, the rulings, you always have to come back to what is the purpose of those rulings uh, as well. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between and i'tikaf? I'tikaf is a ibadah where a person secludes himself in the masjid. And he does not come out of the masjid for the period he is in i'tikaf for. And he does not talk to anyone. And especially he does not talk about umur dunya the, the matters of the dunya. It could be in the daytime. It can be in the daytime, it can be in the nighttime, it can be in Ramadan, it can be outside of Ramadan. The sunnah i'tikaf is 10 nights in Ramadan. That's the sunnah i'tikaf. He only leaves the masjid for a hajjah, like he has to go to the toilet, or he has to do wudu, or he has to do a ghusl, right? Otherwise, he does not leave. So a person can be doing i'tikaf and doing nothing at all. He is just sitting in the masjid quietly. He is not doing dhikr. He is not, he's not, you know, he's not doing a recitation or anything. Okay? But tahajjud, the only way to do tahajjud, like you can't just get up at night and sit there and say, I'm doing tahajjud. No. You have to be praying to be doing the ibadah of tahajjud. Tahiyyatul Masjid. Tahiyyatul Masjid is done when a person enters the masjid, even if he enters the masjid for a lesson. So let's say Brother Ali has prayed in Bukhari house, and he prayed Maghrib there, and then from Maghrib, he prayed the Fard prayer there, and now he is coming to this masjid to listen to the lesson. What does he have to do before he sits down for the lesson? He prays a Turaqa Tahiyyatul Masjid. Okay. This is a uh, voluntary prayer. It is preferred that a person does this before he sits down. According to the Hanafis, even if he sits down, he may pray it again. For the Shafis, he should do it before he sits down. Once he sits down, he loses the reward of the Tahiyyatul Masjid. For the Hanafis, the person when he enters and, for example, the prayer has started, then when he prays the Fard the prayer, he will get the reward of the Tahiyyatul Masjid at the same time. Alright? Because he has combined the Niyyah. Uh, for the Hanafis, it is not permissible to do them at the impermissible time. So let's say someone enters after the Fard the prayer of Fajr before the sunrise. It's an impermissible time to pray anything for us. He has prayed the Fard, he enters the masjid. Now he cannot pray the Tahiyat al-Masjid. He should just do some tasbih. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, akbar, la ilaha illallah, something like this. And the Shafi say that it is allowed that a person, even if he enters at an impermissible time, that he may pray the Tahiyat al-Masjid. Similarly, if someone enters the masjid while the khutbah of Jum'ah is going on, then the Hanafis and the Malikis say no prayer is allowed. Okay? And the Shafi'is and the Hanbalis say that a person may pray the Tahiyyat al-Masjid even though the khutbah is going on. Okay? And this is the, on the basis of one hadith. I'll just explain it to you very briefly. That the Prophet ﷺ saw a man who entered and he sat down doing the khutbah and he told him to get up and pray two rak'ah. Okay? On the basis of this hadith, the Shafi's and the Hanbali say that even if a person enters when the khutbah is going, he should pray two rak'ah. The Hanafis and the Malikis say that this ruling was khas for him so that people could see his state of poverty. Okay? And it was not the uh, action of the Sahaba and the Khulafa al-Rashidun. They would not do this. So on the basis of their action, we say it is not allowed. Okay? Uh, it's not encouraged? This is the Hanafi position. The Shafi position is, on the basis of the Hadith, they act upon it. All right? You have to, so, you know, uh, understand the difference in Usul in the Shafis and the Hanafis, right? The Hanafis do take into account what was the action of the Sahaba to interpret the ahadith, right? So uh, Imam al-Shafi had a different usul. 
that is where the ikhtilaf comes from. Shafi and Hanbali. Shafi and Hanbali, yes. The tahiyya of wudu, the prayer of wudu is two rak'ah. And it is a voluntary prayer that when a person does wudu, he may pray two rak'ah. Yeah. Yes. For example, if, if it's not a mosque, but it's a private, private uh, property, for example, somewhere, mm -hmm. it has it, uh, five, five prayers is done in this. Mm -hmm. Can I take it? It's not a message. Okay, then, so your question basically is what defines a masjid? Yeah. yeah. Okay, a masjid basically is a place where people gather to pray and is designated as a place of worship. Okay, so if let's say uh, I invite you to my house to have dinner and I invite you and I invite you and you all gather and we pray Aisha, does it become a masjid? No, because you're not gathering there for five daily prayers, right? Then the difference between a musalla and a masjid is where one has Jum'ah and one does not have Jum'ah. Okay? So someone like Sumari Musalla is a Musalla. This is a? This is Jami'ah Masjid. Okay? Because Eid is also prayed here, Jum'ah is prayed here, and it is the largest Masjid in the locality. Do we have time to do Taraweeh? Yes, we have time. Okay. Unless you guys are tired and you want to stop right now. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not having that discussion. Uh, we have a few points to cover for Taraweeh. And then um, the 20 rak'ah and the 8 rak'ah discussion, I, I've decided that is a, is a useless discussion because those who are in the 20 camp, uh, there's no point arguing with them. And those who are in the 8 camp, there's no point arguing with them. They, they both have their views. Um, I'll present my views and the evidence for it, but um, basically I'm not doing a debate. Taraweeh is only prayed in Ramadan. It is not prayed outside of Ramadan, and there's no qada for Taraweeh. So why do I say this? The Prophet ﷺ used to pray Tahajjud, okay? And he used to pray it every night. On the occasion where he did not pray it, he would pray it in the daytime. Umar radiallahu anhu, another example, he would pray tahajjud. And wherever he missed it, he would pray it between sunrise and zawal. In the time of duha, he would make up his tahajjud prayer. So the number of hours he would normally do for tahajjud, he would make it up in the daytime. But taraweeh has no such qada. It is prayed between Aisha and Fajr. Now this is important because let's say you enter the masjid and you have not prayed Aisha. Okay? You cannot just say, I'll pray Taraweeh first and then I'll pray Aisha afterwards. You can't do that. You join the jama'ah and if you are not sure that they are praying Aisha or Taraweeh, you make the niyyah of praying Aisha. If you find that in the second rak'ah the imam has done salam, then you get up and you complete two rak'ad. Okay? And then after that, you catch the imam for the remaining taraweeh. And let's say that you caught 16 with the imam, then you make up your four taraweeh by yourself any time before fajr. If fajr enters, taraweeh is gone for that night. The taraweeh itself is a sunnah mu'akkada according to all the madhahib. And this includes the woman. And I state that because the Shia say that it is a sunnah mu'akkada on the men and not the woman. Now the Shia are not a consideration when it comes to fiqh. But sometimes it is worthwhile to know how we are different to the other party. Because it makes it easier to remember. Okay? That it is sunnah mu'akkada. Now why is that important? Because often it is the men that come to the masjid and the women do not. So they have to pray their taraweeh at home. And we discussed in detail the jama'ah of the women and which madhahib allow it and which madhahib don't allow it. The difference is that the taraweeh prayed in a jama'ah is a sunnah kifaya. The praying of the taraweeh itself is sunnah mu'akkada 
and to pray it in a jama'ah is sunnah kifaya. That means, let's say that five of you pray taraweeh in jama'ah in a locality, then it is removed from everyone else to pray it in jama'ah. But everyone else still has to pray the taraweeh as a sunnah mu'akkada even if they are praying by themselves. And if five people pray a jama'ah, it does not prevent another five people doing their own jama'ah as well. So it is permissible in one masjid, if there's sections of the masjid, that there's a jama'ah going on here, and there's jama'ah going on in another portion of the masjid. For example, I think in most years in Gallipoli Mosque, they pray a Ferrari-style taraweeh. And after the Ferrari-style taraweeh is finished, they do a normal style taraweeh in the same masjid. So they have two sets of taraweeh. Uh, and there are you know, other large mosques around the world where they will have a uh, relatively short taraweeh in the main section of the masjid, and they will have a longer taraweeh in other parts. In Ruti Hill, they have three separate taraweeh to my, to my knowledge. They do one where they do one khatam, they have a, where they have a two khatam, and they have a three khatam. Uh, so they finish the Qur'an three times and they have three different jama'ahs going on. Uh, this is to help the uh, hufaz, all the students that have memorized the Qur'an, that they are doing their own taraweeh in the major masjid. And I think this is a good thing because what we'll come to is that the Qur'an does not necessarily need to be finished in the uh, taraweeh. I didn't write it down, but so if I don't talk about it, remind me at the end. So we've got a funny thing happening in this masjid that we pray eight rak'ah and then they do witr and then they do the remaining 20 and then they do another witr, right? So I've never prayed like that because I don't pray taraweeh in this masjid in particular. Is this legally valid or not? What do you think? What did I say to you about witr beforehand? The preferable thing is that witr is the last prayer of the night. But it is perfectly valid that the person has prayed the witr, then he prays the taraweeh, or he prays the taraweeh, then the witr, or he has taraweeh, then the witr, and then more taraweeh. Any of those are valid. Why will this happen now? For example, you came late to the masjid and you missed 10 taraweeh. Right? Now the imam has, is going to pray 10 more taraweeh, and then he will do witr, so it is preferable to pray the witr with the imam. So you prayed 10 by yourself with the imam, then you pray the witr and you still have 10 to go. Right? So you will pray another 10 taraweeh later on. So this is valid and can be done. The imam himself cannot pray two witr and the follower cannot pray two witrs. Okay? So you can't say that, oh, I'll pray a witr with the imam and then I'll do my own witr at the end of the night. You can't do that. Why is this? Because all the fara'id together have to end up in an odd number. Fajr is even, Dhuhr is even, Asr is even, Aisha is even, Maghrib is odd. When you add all of these, you get an odd number. And the prayers are five, another odd number. When you pray taraweeh, it is an even number, 2, 2, 2 until 20, right? And then the witr makes it an, as an odd number, right? So the taraweeh are even numbers and the, the witr makes it an odd number. So if you prayed two witrs, what did you do? You made 3 plus 3 is 6. Even now you made it an even number and you can't finish with that. So all the further prayers should be an odd number, all the voluntary prayers should be an odd number and the way to do it is to pray their witr once in the night. Got it? Okay. No. The, okay, yes, the Prophet ﷺ has done this where he has prayed taraweeh, he's prayed witr and he has prayed tahajjud. Yes. But it is permissible and it is written in the books that a person may pray the witr in the middle of the taraweeh. It is permissible. So the reason they do it here is because of the fitna of 8 and 20. So 90% of people leave after 8. And so the people desire to pray the witr before they go. That's why they're doing it here. I personally dislike it to the degree that I don't pray here. <laughs> but is it permissible? Yes, it's permissible. 
adopt that because you're going to be leading prayers. I heard. Is that is that true? <laughs> so far, I've, I'm not leading the prayer. Are you not? I'm not leading the not prayer. Uh, discussion outside of this video, <laughs> inshallah. Um, the taraweeh is 20 raka'at with 10 taslima. Okay? This is according to all the fuqaha. Not a single faqih says 8 raka'at. Okay? Imam Ibn Taymiyyah included. All right? Are we clear on that position? Is there any further discussion to happen? Can you give me a faqih that says eight raka'at? Historically, we'll find none. If someone can bring me some evidence to the contrary, then I will look into it. But to my knowledge, all of the fuqaha say 20 raka'at, and there's no difference of opinion among them. Umar bin Abdul Aziz in Medina made the taraweeh 36 raka'at. So the fuqaha say it is permissible to increase it beyond 20. But the sunnah mu'akada is 20. On the basis that Umar bin al-Khattab, when he set up taraweeh, he set it up as 20 and not a single sahabi who was alive at the time in Medina and outside of Medina objected to 20 rak'at. None, not a single one of them said, why are we praying 20? It should be 8. Okay. So this is called Ijma' Sukuti, the Ijma' of the Sahaba by silence. Okay? An Ijma', remember, is always done on the ulama of the Sahaba, <coughs> right? We're not dealing with a Sahabi who didn't have knowledge. No, we're dealing with the ulama of the Sahaba. All of them did Ijma', the Taraweeh is how many rak'at? 20 rak'at. And they also have Ijma', that it is 10 taslima. So Imam Abu Hanifa says that if someone prayed four raka'ah taraweeh with one taslima, it will count as two raka'ah. All right. So I did pray in the masjid and I found them praying four raka'ah with one taslima. So I did my salam and I came out. By that time, by the time I crossed five rows, they had already done two raka'ah. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. Anyway, that was one of the years they were praying that way. Wallahu alam, what they do right now. I don't want to name people. They pray in Redfern as well. Sorry? In Redfern, they pray four raka'ah with one taslim. In, in, the, in the books of, uh, of, the, of the Hanafi fiqh, say that that is disliked to the degree that they only count it as two raka'ah. And the other madahib say it should be two by two. They don't have an option of four. So it's, it's one of those things that you see happening, but actually on the basis of the books, it should not be happening. After every two taslima, meaning after every four raka'ah, there is a rest. And that rest is recommended. Okay? You don't have to do it, but it is recommended. And the recommended period is that that is resting for as long as you did the recitation. So let's say you recited, your recitation was for 12 minutes, the resting is for 12 minutes. However, the imam may drop this if he finds that it's difficult for the people. How will it be difficult? Well, if you did this after every four raka'ah, you will double the time of the taraweeh. And that will mean it will finish later. So all those people who are tradies, shopkeepers, they will struggle to pray taraweeh. So the imam may drop uh, this. The sunnah is to complete one Qur'an in Ramadan in taraweeh. In the Ikhtiyar, which is one of the major Hanafi books written about a thousand years ago, it stated that the recitation may be shorter than that if finishing one Qur'an will deter the people from attending Taraweeh. And the reality in Sydney is almost no one will attend if you finish the whole Qur'an in Taraweeh. Except for maybe, so if we have a masjid of, I have noticed that if the first two rak'ah there's 20 lines, 18 lines regularly, and by the end there is barely one line. So basically 90% of people will not attend if you are finishing the Qur'an. It is, it is probably preferable that in a locality there is a masjid that is finishing the entire Qur'an, so whoever wants to attend that can attend it, and there are taraweeh that are brief, so that people who are doing physical hard work in the daytime, 
or business or shopkeepers who are doing hard work, they can attend a briefer taraweeh. They don't have to attend a taraweeh that completes the entire Quran. One finish with sitting. Sorry? Sitting, when, when the recitation is very long. Yes. And you can stand, so you sit down. This is, if a person is unable to stand, right, that then applies for a fard prayer, a wajib prayer, or a sunnah prayer. He may pray it sitting down because he's unable to stand. Okay? See some people, they wait. So when they see the, the imam, they say, just to come to, to, they stand up. And it is makruh to wait until the imam is about to do the ruku'ah. Yeah. Okay? <coughs> Except if a person has a, you know, an excuse for this. So for example, he is eating something or, you know, whatever, something like that, you know, he's finishing his food or whatever, then, he's, then he joins the prayer when they're about to go into ruku'ah. This is valid. This is from the action of the munafiqeen to delay catching the jama'ah until it is ruku'ah time. So some say that it is makruh tahariman to do this intentionally because it is the likeness of the munafiqeen. However, if you know, someone has a valid excuse, he may do this. If someone is tired, you know, he may rest for two rakah, and then join the two rakah afterwards. If someone's very tired, last year I had a, a disc prolapse. I, I prayed half my taraweeh sitting down. I couldn't stand at all. So I prayed behind these boys and I sat down. Finish the Quran in whole Ramadan or one Taraweeh? No, no, no. The whole Ramadan. Yeah, so that will mean one Juz a night. One Juz in one night. Mm -hmm. Not the whole Quran in one night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Finish the whole Quran in Ramadan. Isn't that clear? Yes? Okay. The Imam should not leave any of the wajibat component of the prayer even if the people find it difficult he should not leave the Ibrahimiyya even though it is sunnah for the Hanafis because it is a wajib for the Shafi'is right? so he should not leave the Ibrahimiyya because of the ikhtilaf there he should not leave the istiftah he should not leave the tasbih in the ruku' and the sujood. He may make it brief, but he should not leave them. He may leave the dua before the taslim. So you know how regularly we will say a tashahud and then we'll do Ibrahimiyyah and then we'll do dua and then taslim. So to make it briefer, he may leave the dua between the Ibrahimiyyah and the taslim to make it slightly briefer and easier for the people. This is all the rulings with regards to the Taraweeh. Any questions? So if I have not prayed with the, with the Jama'ah, 